First, I want to thank uh, the organizers, uh, especially Jim and Peter. So uh, the theme of this conference is right in the sweet spot of uh, what I'm interested in and what we do in our lab that is uh, studying neural coding and trying to understand neural representational spaces, um, specifically in um, the ventral pathway, which uh, I, I always, almost always open with this, di this beautiful diagram uh, taken from one of Tommy's uh, papers that outlines um, uh, stages in the ventral pathway in a Van Essen style diagram but picks them out in color. Here's V1, V2, V4, uh, posterior parts of uh, IT, anterior parts of IT. Um, and then this part of the figure represents what I see as uh, sort of the job or uh, one of the main things that gets accomplished uh, by this hierarchy of areas that's performing some kind of uh, uh, transformation of uh, information. And um, this is how I think about it. Uh, when we're talking about early object rep representations, uh, obviously all the visual information that we ever going to have exists in those representations, but it's not in a form that's uh, useful. Uh, first of all, it's extremely distributed over a very large number of channels. If we're thinking of the photoreceptor layer in the retina, you've got millions of channels, millions of neurons. Uh, uh, it's, it's essentially like a megapixel camera camera image, and that's just an intractable signal. It's not the sort of thing that you could store into memory. You can't uh, spend uh, you know, millions of memory slots uh, to remember something. It's not the sort of thing that you could uh, send over a reasonable, reasonable bandwidth of uh, axonal connections to other parts of the brain that need to know visual information. So. Um, uh, it's the, these early representations are too distributed. The kind of information we need, for example, object identity, is far too implicit. That means it would take too many operations uh, to, to pull out something like my name out of the image that's hitting your eye right now. So uh, it's not very useful because it requires a whole lot of decoding. And finally, it's extremely variable. So an object like me, depending on my distance and my orientation and my postural pose and lighting and partial occlusion by the table. Um, those kinds of uh, variations uh, produce an, a virtual infinity of possible uh, retinal images that could correspond to me and the system always has to generalize to the same solution. So that's, that's another thing that makes these early object representations, the, the informational format, not very useful for the rest of the brain. And so what I see is one of the major jobs of the ventral pathway is through the stepwise transformation to turn a very distributed signal into one that's much more compressed, compressed enough that you could store something in memory, compressed enough that you could, uh, that um, uh, prefrontal cortex could access that information to guide behavior over a reasonable number of axons. Uh, I think what is originally very implicit representations of uh, objects, object structure, object identity, everything we know about objects has to become much more explicit. That is, it has to be a very readable code so that um, uh, if prefrontal cortex wants to access information about objects, uh, it can do it without having to go through a lot of decoding steps to make that information useful. You basically want to make this, you want to do this decoding once in the ventral pathway and then make that available to the rest of the brain. And finally, you have to turn something that's very, that's extremely variable into something that's uh, much more stable. And um, I think, you know, people are going to be touching on these themes throughout the conference. And what I'm going to try to talk about first of all uh, uh, is something in intermediate vision, uh, neural coding in intermediate vision and uh, very recently published work that suggests how the transformation of object information in V4 relates to this idea of compression. And um, if I have time, and I'll, I'll at least advert to it uh, briefly at the end, I'll uh, jump all the way up to anterior IT and talk about uh, object representations there and talk about how uh, uh, 
they uh, achieve some explicit representation of uh, complex object structure. So, uh, you know, part of the theme of uh, this conference is population coding. So, I'm going back to a 2002 paper by uh, Neetha Pasipathy, um, looking at or trying to understand something about population coding in V4. In general, our approach has been to sample object space as effectively as possible. It's a very hard thing to do because object space is virtually infinite. But we do our best job uh, and then fit mathematical models that try to describe what kind of information uh, cells or populations of cells in different stages of the ventral pathway, what kind of information they encode. In the same way uh, uh, people understand that uh, V1 neurons are encoding information about oriented spatial frequency, or MT neurons are encoding information about uh, stereoscopic depth and uh, local direction of motion, we'd like to understand um, uh, neural coding uh, in various stages of the ventral pathway in the same way. So this is uh, a relatively early attempt in V4, and I won't uh, uh, go through and explain this stimulus set, but this shows the stimulus set that we used to study a bunch of V4 neurons, and it was intended to uh, you know, cover some range of the possible um, a space of a two-dimensional silhouette object outlines, and uh, then learn something about uh, neural coding of those outlines. And this represents the results for a single V4 neuron. Uh, the little white shapes are uh, representations of the stimuli that were flashed up on a computer screen while a macaque monkey sat there just doing a fixation test. We'd already figured out where the receptive field is. We're flashing them multiple times in the receptive field and ultimately measuring the average neural response to each stimulus, which is represented by the background color behind each stimulus, where light gray corresponds to no response at all, and uh, black corresponds to uh, about 35 spikes per second. Uh, so if you look across um, uh, all of these stimuli, first of all, uh, something uh, uh, you should notice is that um, there are a variety of stimuli with black backgrounds that drive very strong responses. Uh, and um, this is a, a very important result because many people in um, studying the ventral pathway uh, believe in this idea of an ideal stimulus, the best stimulus to drive a cell. And if you could find that stimulus, then that stimulus contains all the information necessary for understanding what that cell does. So we've never seen that. We've never seen that even if we go all the way to anterior IT. There's a wide, wide range of stimuli that evoke maximal responses from cells. And cells are, in, instead of responding to global shape, they're responding to something that is less than global shape, something substructural. And this, this is the basic uh, insight that theorists led, uh, like David Marr and Irv Biederman and many people uh, before them actually had that um, neural coding of object structure would probably be ensemble coding and ensemble coding in terms of parts. And uh, if you have ensemble coding in terms of parts, then you expect every neuron to respond to lots of different objects as long as each of those objects has a part that drives that neuron. And this is a great example. So if you look at uh, the objects that have dark or black backgrounds, long enough, what you'll discover is uh, their common factor is they've got sharpish convex curvature near the top of the shape. The global cha shape changes a lot, but what's consistent is this sharp curvature near the top. As I say, uh, we try to um, describe this sort of thing uh, with uh, mathematical tuning functions. Here, very simple way uh, of describing at least you know, part of the variance of responses here is uh, to create a two-dimensional Gaussian tuning function. And our two dimensions are just position. These are pretty simple shapes. So you, uh, you can just describe position with one variable, uh, angular position, where 0 means off to the right of the object, 90 means near the top, 180 means towards the left, 270 towards the bottom. Um, and then our vertical dimension here is curvature. Zero means something that's flat. 
Um, 1.0 means extremely sharp convex curvature. Convex curvature is uh, curvature uh, around a, a place in the outline that's uh, sort of indenting away from the center. Concave curvature protruding away from the center. And concave curvature would be indentation in towards the center of an object. And this just represents, um, this is squashed curvature. So curvature actually um, is um, rate of change in um, orientation uh, with respect to contour length. Orientation, which is such an important tuning dimension in V1, is a derivative. Curvature is a second order derivative on top of orientation. It's how fast orientation is uh, changing. Um, so one corresponds to very sharp convex, 0.5 is broader convex, zero is flat, negative numbers are concave. So uh, then the interesting thing that uh, Anitha did here was um, an exercise of uh, taking responses recorded from many neurons over the course of months and then putting them together to try to uh, guess at what uh, the ensemble response across lots of V4 neurons would look like for a given object. And in this example, uh, she's taking this object here and trying to reconstruct what the uh, overall V4 response would look like if you could look at lots of cells at once. And the way she did that was for each cell, she looked at um, the uh, actual response of the cell to that stimulus. Here, uh, this is very high. She used that response uh, to weight the tuning function of that cell, and she added that weighted tuning function into this plot here. And she did that for over 100 cells that she recorded from, and this is the pattern that you get. And uh, you'll notice a peak here. Uh, that peak was uh, something that uh, this cell contributed to, and it corresponds to the sharp convexity at the top of this shape. Uh, these peaks down here in the concave region uh, correspond to these concave uh, parts of the boundary off to the upper left and off to the upper right. Uh, these concavities off to the left and right are represented by this peak and this peak and so forth. So <clears throat> I think that um, this is not the result that you might have uh, predicted based on what we knew about uh, neurophysiology in earlier areas, where the concentration is not on curvature, it's on, um, it's on uh, oriented spatial frequency, it's its own orientation. And if you just uh, took that theme of representing oriented edges and rid it larger, um, what you would expect to see in this uh, population plot is not a bunch of stuff uh, near these high curvature regions. You'd expect to see a bunch of stuff near zero. In fact, I, I think if you did this same exercise, if you could, in V1 or V2, you'd see a lot of peaks uh, down around zero. So the question is, why, do we see, uh, uh, why don't we see a lot of representation of zero curvature? Why do we see so much representation of higher curvature? So this is what I'm uh, going to purport to relate to the, the idea of compression. This is uh, just um, uh, something else that Nietzsche did, taking um, these patterns and trying to reconstruct the original shape just based on the neural pattern. You can do that with some degree of accuracy. So then how does this relate to um, one of the goals of this transformation, that is compression? Well, there's an idea that goes way back at least to Fred Atney's famous 1954 Psychological Review article that uh, regions of higher curvature are the regions of shapes that carry the most information. And um, uh, here's an important quote. He says, information is concentrated at points where a contour changes direction most rapidly. That is uh, fastest change in orientation. That is highest curvature. Uh, and he also said common objects may be represented with great economy, that is, um, in a compressed, sparse, or efficient fashion, and with fairly striking fidelity by copying the points of uh, maximal uh, direction change and connecting them with a straight edge. And he did that um, to make this famous uh, drawing of a cat, Atney's cat, based on uh, doing that procedure with um, <clears throat> with uh, a photograph of a cat that he had. That's a pretty informal 
anecdotal sort of thing that he did, but uh, since then, he did uh, psychophysics. Many other people have done psychophysics uh, that support this idea that there's more information in regions of high curvature than, um, than in other parts of the shape. So uh, in a recently published study done by uh, graduate students uh, Eric Carlson and Russell Resquina, uh, they went back and first of all tried to test whether this bias towards acute curvature is real. Uh, you know, maybe we got that result here just because we used a lot of really curvy stimuli. And if it is real, um, does it really relate to this idea of uh, uh, compression? So um, <clears throat> one of the great problems in studying the ventral pathway is, uh, as I said, you've got this virtually infinite object space. Uh, you don't know what the dimensionality of that space is. Somewhere in that space, you've got a tuning function. And um, in a typical experiment, you sample that uh, space randomly with photographs or junk objects. And if you're lucky, you get one or two sample points that actually drive responses from a cell. But that doesn't tell you what information that cell is representing. The only way it could tell you the information the cell is representing if this, it would be if the cell is just uh, a pure binary categorical cell. And there was one thing it responded to all the time and nothing else. And then you know, getting uh, one stimulus response, uh, that, would, that would work. But, but to really understand uh, what information a cell is encoding, you, what you want to do is sample densely across this entire region, densely enough that you could constrain a mathematical model of um, the information in this unknown dimensionality uh, that a cell is conveying. So in recent experiments, um, uh, we've uh, been trying this adaptive sampling technique that starts out with a first generation of stimuli that look like this, uh, but then goes on to a second generation of stimuli that leverages what we discovered during the first generation uh, by uh, creating uh, lots of descendant stimuli that are partially morphed versions of higher response ancestor stimuli from earlier generations. So these partial morphs represent uh, local jumps in, um, in this space. And the idea is to iterate this process across generations with the purpose of getting uh, dense enough sampling along the peaks, the shoulders, the boundaries of this region that you could constrain a mathematical model of what cells are really doing. And uh, so Eric uh, did this kind of experiment in V4 with the idea that this would provide a much more agnostic way uh, than uh, we used in Anitha's experiments to figure out what V4 cells are, are really coding. And uh, this is just a diagram of technically how he did this. So uh, you've, you've got a V4 receptive field. And in order to construct initially random stimuli, he uh, used random placement of spline control points to draw what is essentially a, uh, a random uh, boundary in the receptive field, and then rendered that um, so that uh, the, uh, on one side of that boundary, you've got a figure. On the other side of that boundary, you've got background. And then actually used motion against texture cues to uh, give a clear perceptual uh, figure ground orientation to that. And then during the adaptive or evolutionary part of the experiment, there were lots of different things that he would do to these stimuli. If, if a stimulus was picked to be an, uh, in, a, in a probabilistic fashion, got picked to be an ancestor stimulus, uh, various uh, uh, minor morphing things uh, that involved changing um, the, uh, the exact positions of these spline control points to change local curvature, um, uh, changing uh, positions of multiple spline control points, adding new spline control points to create uh, more complex features, changing the figure ground relationship, uh, changing whether the figure was something that uh, extended past the receptive field boundaries or just ex existed within the receptive field and so forth. <clears throat> so here's an example. Single neuron in V4 recorded from um, <clears throat> an animal performing a fixation test while these stimuli are flashed up in uh, the animals uh, in, in the V4 receptive field. 
Um, we use two independently evolving lineages uh, so that we can verify that uh, they converge to the same place, uh, that we're getting uh, a relatively unique answer instead of uh, something uh, that's you know, just wandering off into uh, object space. So here's the first generation of stimuli for lineage one. Uh, for this uh, uh, cell. Uh, it gives you an idea of the, the range of random stimuli that uh, Eric's system was capable of creating. Here's the first generation of stimuli for lineage two. Again, background color using this scale here indicates uh, the average response to each of these stimuli. In general, very low responses back here in the first uh, generation. But by the time uh, we've gone through, I think, 10 generations, um, what's done here is to collect all the highest response stimuli in lineage one across all 10 generations and the highest response stimuli in lineage two. Uh, across all 10 generations. You can see by eye that there's a convergence in um, shape characteristics uh, between these uh, two. That is, um, in both lineage one and lineage two, what's evolved uh, uh, for high response shapes are things that have a sharp convex uh, uh, curved point that's uh, pointing towards the upper left and above that uh, or somewhere around in the figure uh, a uh, shallower concavity. These are just uh, some other examples, different cells showing um, uh, just um, qu at least qualitative convergence between lineage one and lineage two, lineage one, lineage two, lineage one, lineage two. So then, um, again, trying to be as agnostic as possible. So um, I think this is a much more agnostic uh, experiment than Anitha's because honestly you, you could have evolved almost anything uh, as part of this procedure and it was the cell pushing uh, the results in a particular direction, not the experimenter deciding ahead what would be a good stimulus for V4. Um, <clears throat> to continue in that agnostic vein, uh, rather than doing what we've done frequently in the past, which is to, um, to uh, fit a nonlinear model using a MATLAB function. All we did here uh, was basically sort of a spike triggered average of all the stimuli in uh, this space here. So this space, uh, the horizontal axis is, um, is uh, just orientation of contours. And we have a slightly different um, convention than most people. So zero means uh, a contour uh, where the, uh, the edge facing away from the object is facing towards the right, and 90 means facing towards the top, and 180 means facing towards the left, etc. And here's our curvature scale here. Again, it's squashed. 90, negative one means uh, extremely sharp concave curvature. Zero is flat. Uh, one is extremely sharp convex curvature. Uh, so what we did for each stimulus was to densely sample it along the contour, find all the bins in this finely bin space in which it uh, had at least one sample and sum the response of the neuron uh, to that stimulus into that bin. We do that for all the stimuli. We smooth and also threshold, and this is the pattern we get, and it's a pattern that, um, that corresponds, in, at least in a qualitative way, with what you can see here. That is, there's uh, this big blob for convex curvature um, in a range from about 90 to 180 that corresponds to these sharp convexities pointing off towards the upper left. And then there's a, um, there's a peak here that corresponds to uh, the, the concavities in these stimuli. So then what we really wanted to do was to see uh, what, the, what the biases uh, in tuning across the entire population of 110 cells that Eric recorded from uh, were. So he did this for every stimulus, and then he uh, averaged those all together across 110 stimuli, and this is the pattern that he got. And um, confirming uh, Anita's uh, results, but I think in a much more powerful way, uh, there's much more representation of uh, curvature, especially com acute curvature, uh, compared to uh, representation of, uh, of flat orientation.
Um, this is just some statistics to verify that. Uh, so uh, you've already seen these. Um, uh, this plot is based just on lineage one from each cell. This plot is based just on lineage two from each cell. It shows the uh, repeatability of this result. Um, you can do a bootstrapping procedure taking randomly one uh, of the two lineages from each cell many times in order to get a confidence interval, a 95% confidence interval on this function of uh, response weight versus curvature. And again, uh, you've got a lot of weight for uh, acute concave and acute convex curvature. And you've got this big dip around flat curvature. OK, so, so, uh, so what does that mean uh, for uh, achieving a compressed representation of shape? So to look at that, Russell Rosquina um, did some modeling of V4 responses. Um, training on natural images outline. So taking photographic images, 11,000 photographic images from the Hemera database, uh, and pulling out the uh, outlines of those images uh, as a, uh, a natural image uh, training set to train very simple V4 models. So V4 cells that are simply uh, uh, tuned for curvature, for orientation and for angular position, the same uh, dimensions that um, our neurophysiology, I think, uh, previously shows uh, provide um, a fair, fairly efficient way of describing uh, what V4 neurons are doing. And um, so this is just meant to be three different example cells. We fixed, to keep things as simple as possible, we really fixed the standard deviations of these Gaussian tuning functions uh, to be the same for all cells, just cut down on the number of parameters. And the only thing that was varying during training was the position of the means. And depending on the positions of the means, uh, these cells would respond differentially to different parts of uh, different object boundaries. And so our optimization criteria, first of all, uh, for pairwise discrimination era, era, error. Uh, so obviously, um, a, a very important thing uh, for the system to maintain um, as uh, you uh, do this transformation is the ability to discriminate between objects. Um, so uh, uh, Russell was. Um, simulating 100 V4 neurons at a time. And uh, so this discrimination criterion was just making sure that whenever you picked a pair of two objects and you looked at the 100 different activation values, they weren't the same. They were different enough that you could tell those, uh, those two objects apart. Uh, so the discrimination error, the similarity error, error was just trying to make sure that uh, two neurons didn't wind up encoding the same thing because we wanted to force our model to really have a hundred different units in it, not uh, a bunch of units the same. And then finally, uh, there's uh, this uh, optimization criteria, response density. This is a, a very standard um, formula for characterizing response density is basically uh, the expected response of the ith neuron to the jth stimulus. Uh, that expected response, um, right, uh, the expected response squared divided by um, the expected squared response. And um, I won't explain how, but um, if you're just talking about um, binary units that um, can be off or on, uh, if you evaluate uh, uh, response density using this formula, then um, if all your units are on all the time, you get a value of 1. If none of your units are on at all, you get a value of 0. But it, it uh, also translates up to units like we study, uh, where you've got variable variable responses. So, so here are the results of five stimulations. Um, so uh, 500 simulated V4 neurons plotted against a color background that just represents the observed distribution of V4 tuning. And all the little uh, uh, white circles represent um, the tuning means, the means of the Gaussian uh, tuning functions after optimization 
uh, just for uh, discrimination and lack of similarity with no constraint on response density. And um, you know, we get uh, very good performance on 3,000 um, shapes that we held out uh, didn't use for training, but still, you know, like uh, around 99% uh, accuracy in pairwise discrimination. Um, but the, um, the response density is around 0 0.8. And that means in general, um, in response to any given object, about 80% of the neurons in our model are firing at a fairly high rate. And that's an undesirable thing. People have written about this for years, that um, um, it's, it's better to have sparse or compact or compressed or efficient coding than it is to have uh, very promiscuous coding like that. You don't want all your neurons firing all the time because it's energy expensive. Uh, it makes for very bad uh, memory storage requirements. It takes up a lot of bandwidth to send that signal over. You want a much sparser signal. So, uh, so then uh, we started doing the same um, simulation, but adding a response density requirement and adding it in uh, logarithmic increments. And you can see what happens as you, uh, as you increase the weight of this error term. Um, what originally had been a concentration of uh, tuning near zero curvature uh, changes into a concentration of tuning near acute curvature. And by the time you've uh, made this weight this high, the response density has gone down from 80%, which is highly undesirable, down to 10%, uh, which is much more desirable. So an, an eight-fold uh, difference in response density, depending on whether you know, your simulated V4 neuro, uh, units are all tuned uh, for flat sections of contours versus whether they're all tuned uh, or mostly all tuned for um, much more curved contour sec sections. Um, <clears throat> this uh, sort of uh, represents that progression uh, for uh, some uh, example stimuli and um, uh, the square of colored pixels represents the responses of uh, 500 V4 units where the brightness of the pixel represents the strength of the response and the color of the pixel represents um, whether the response is, uh, whether the cell is tuned for uh, flat curvature that's white or convex curvature that's cyan or concave curvature that's uh, magenta. And uh, you know, as you add this uh, requirement, you go from uh, lots of cells being responsive to a few cells being responsive. And the few cells that are responsive uh, uh, have more color. They're more tuned for curvature. And it's really pretty obvious um, why uh, moving your, uh, your response range up into high curvature regions would work in that if you look at the distribution of uh, curvature values in the stimuli themselves, there's a really strong concentration on um, near uh, flat curvature. And there's much less uh, information on here. So if you've got cells that are tuned in this region, they're going to be firing all the time because almost every stimulus is going to have uh, lots of uh, curvature in this region. Uh, whereas if you go out here, um, uh, cells are going to fire a lot less because uh, any given uh, shape has uh, only a few points out here, but those points remain extremely diagnostic because uh, in these uh, simulations, uh, you know, we, we continue to get uh, very high discriminability. So um, our uh, speculation is that uh, this, this bias towards uh, representing uh, local curvature maxima uh, is actually uh, a strategy and a very good strategy for achieving one of the uh, most important goals of this transformation of the ventral pathway that is uh, a much more compressed signal. And I'll stop there. So I understand the appeal of wanting to look at contours and simple objects that are in isolation, and one can't argue with the statistics that came out. But 
What happens when we start looking at complex scenes where objects have interiors, textures, there's occlusion, there's overlap? It seems to me that's going to introduce a lot of points of high curvature mm -hmm. and will have a corresponding impact mm -hmm. on the compression. So, um, yeah, I, I agree. You could go a lot further in trying to compress. I think um, one caveat about natural scenes is that um, um, you, you really need attention to sort out a natural scene. That is, you know, a complex photograph like this, you don't process it all at once. Um, you attend to and even saccade to use your fovea for a particular region. And um, so uh, you know, the idea of our experiment is to avoid having to deal with attention by just putting one clear thing up there. And, um, uh, hopefully getting the kind of responses that you would get to that thing, even if it were within a natural scene, if you were paying attention to it. Right, uh, but you have to assume segmentation also, because it's not just that it's foveal, but that you've separated it from mm -hmm. the background and you have an object at your disposal. Yeah, no question. So okay. we're, we're sidestepping the problem of segmentation. And, but, but I would also say that segmentation uh, is going to depend on attention. And it's going to depend on, uh, so I'm, I mean, most computer vision people would say that you can't do segmentation first and then recognition, that you really need recognition to guide segmentation. Um, so I mean, this is, this is just a piece of the story. It doesn't. Uh, yeah. um, the objects, they're placed where? Do you, do you find a center for the receptive field and then put the thing down in the middle of that? So are you is thinking it, of the... Is it really translation invariant? I mean, does it are matter? you thinking of the V4 work or the IT The work? V4 work. I, well, actually, either one. Well, V4 uh, work, um, you put things in the uh, center of the um, receptive field in a main test. Does the size matter? Uh, um, I, I'm wonder, I guess I'm wondering what, what, how much invariance there is to getting that position specifically in, in v, right. Specifically in, in V4. V4. Yeah. Um, so there's a limit to invariance in V4 uh, because it's limited by receptive field size. Lots of size invariance in IT. Not perfect. Um, you wouldn't call it position invariance in IT because not surprisingly responses go down as you get away from the fovea, right? Um, uh, so this is... Um, but you might expect that even if the responses go down that the tuning properties are conserved. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. So, it, right, invariance is a bad word, consistency is a good word uh, for what happens in IT. So V4 shows that kind of property. Um, you know, to the extent possible within its small receptive field. So you can't move, you can't, uh, move things around a whole lot unless you're going to make them really small. So for this example cell, um, this uh, is one experiment that, uh, that uh, tries to get at uh, this idea of um, um, generalization across tuning for object-centered uh, position. Eh, maybe it doesn't do that great a job. But, but um, here we're taking, for a, ver for a completely different cell, um, the, the part of the shape that's uh, really driving it is uh, sharp convexity uh, towards the lower right of the shape. And this is just a series that um, uh, changes the position of that uh, sharp convexity relative to the rest of the shape. And, and are, you, are most of your cells, uh, how far peripheral are there? Are they generally? So we tried to study uh, foveal or parafoveal mm -hmm. V4. So uh, most stuff is um, you know, with, within three degrees. Got it. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Ed, can you say something more about the uh, methodological advantages of these search techniques? I, I think you said that you didn't think there were single peaks um, um, that was one of your opening statements, yet the method you use seems to imply a search for a single peak uh, and then uh, even the data you were plotting were sort of here are the best stimuli and that's what you're plotting so, on the so, so what I meant to say was that there's no single peak um, in the entirety of object space. So single peak only has meaning if you define what the domain you're searching for a peak <laughs> is. So if the domain is all objects, I'd say definitely not a single peak. And, that, and that's clearly shown in, um, in the results of these 
of these experiments. So um, you wind up getting, uh, so these are all high response stimuli from one lineage and from another lineage for the same cell. They obviously don't have the same global shape. What they share is this part of their shape. So there is a single peak in substructure space, in the space that's described by these templates. There is not a single peak in, um, you know, in the entirety of object space. Does that make sense? I, I wanted to ask a little more also about the adaptive technique. So it's a very cool approach and something people don't do enough in, in physiology. Uh, and certainly in psychophysics, there's a long history of doing adaptive stimulus design, even something as simple as a staircase. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I'm wondering, in, in psychophysics, it's very easy to, to say, so it's sort of mathematically, that the stimuli you're choosing are optimal with respect to the estimation of a parameter-like threshold. And you can write down that you should actually pick stimuli near threshold in order to get a better estimate of threshold. Uh, I'm wondering, in this case, is it possible to say what exactly you're optimizing by putting stimuli or picking stimuli the way you do? Because there are sort of weird limiting cases where I can imagine only showing stimuli from the sort of sub part of the space that the cell prefers actually tells you very little because you need so, to know the difference. So that's, ex that's a great point and it's exactly right. So we're not trying to simply optimize response strength. Uh, in fact, we design our algorithm not to simply converge on a highest response uh, stimulus. Uh, we design it, um, what we really want to do is take the normal situation, so with just random sampling, if you looked at the histogram of responses, you'd see a big peak around zero. And then you'd see very little activity um, you know, out near um, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 spikes per second. The ideal, what we'd really like to do, is make that distribution flat so that we were sampling evenly across the entire response range. And that's what we try to do. So um, I glossed over this, but in fact what we do is to divide um, you know, all our stimuli uh, according to the neurons response range. And we have a certain percentage of uh, ancestors from the high response range, from the moderate, from the low, so that we keep on sampling along the shoulders and the boundaries. Because just as you say, you don't learn much from just the peak. You've got to see what the shape is. Yeah. Good point. Peter. So <clears throat> a given uh, point on a contour, high curvature point on a contour can count as a convexity or a concavity depending on which side of the contour the figure is on. Mm -hmm. But if these uh, responses are localistic, how, do they, how does the cell know which side of the contour is the figure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I don't have the answer to that. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the range of possibilities are there's some local computation in V4 or there's some uh, feedback um, uh, from uh, higher level areas that defines that. I mean, one thing that's uh, consistent in V4 and PIT and AIT that we've always found is that um, cells are, uh, you know, as you lose tuning for retinotopic position, you gain really acute tuning for uh, uh, position relative uh, to the rest of the object, position in an object-centered uh, reference frame. And that's very strong in V4, like night and day, depending on where on the object you are, um, and extremely strong in IT. So there has to be some mechanism um, that uh, computes uh, a geometric center or a center of mass or some kind of center for an object or computes that uh, re re reference frame. And conceivably, that mechanism, whatever it is, uh, has something to do with uh, figure ground uh, assignment of contours. Um, obviously, there's, um, there's uh, Rudiger van der Heidt's work showing that uh, you've got you know, strong sensitivity to uh, figure ground uh, relationships uh, in V2. I'd say there, that clearly needs to be feedback from higher areas because it extends over um, uh, such large parts of the visual field, but that's controversial. Can I ask a question? Okay. So um, you made an intriguing comment about how the skeletal structure is very important for things like bodies yeah. and animals. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of work on uh, representation in IT cortex that looks at representation of categories of, of objects. Mm -hmm. 
And have you tried to explicitly relate these kinds of axial or skeletal descriptions to the categories of the objects and see if they provide a, a good basis? Yeah, that? so we, we do have an experiment like that. Um, and uh, still doing analysis on that. I hope something will come out soon. Um, I, I think um, it's taken a long time because the data set could have been better. But th th that's a great idea. Um, uh, in general, I think it's important for people to start using multiple kinds of stimuli in the same experiment, and obviously photographic stimuli and abstract stimuli would be a way to go, and what's the level of explanation you can get between the two domains. Yeah. It's a great idea. How soon? Well, um, well I'll, I'll communicate you know, what we've found so far. I can show some examples to you privately. Um, I'm hoping by the end of the year, but 